Hello and welcome to the Mayor's Press Conference for November. Today is November 13th, 2020. Today we have some special guests with us. We have Bill Bumgartner, the hospital CEO here in Spencer. We have Dan Skelton, who is the chairman of the county, Clay County Supervisors. And we have Terry Heeman, who is the superintendent of the Spencer Community Schools. The primary purpose of this uh, press conference today is to update you on city activities as well as discuss the rising cases of COVID-19 in our community and uh, the key uh, leaders from the key organizations uh, who have to manage COVID-19 are present in the press conference to explain to you where their organizations are at related to the pandemic, uh, what their plans are, and then also if we have time and are able to, we will try to field some questions if they are asked during this live update. With that, uh, I would like to give you a very brief economic development update uh, with the city of Spencer. As we've talked about before, throughout the pandemic, uh, activity has continued to happen. There are businesses that are growing in our community. You'll notice a lot of activity downtown with building renovations. Uh, Wheezy's is starting to finish up their uh, facade update. Looks very nice. Thank you, Darren, for doing that. You'll notice the old white drug building is currently under a little rehab. Uh, Tim Steffen is taking care of that. So thank you for your investment in the community as it regards to that. Uh, also, there are several uh, businesses who have inquired and have an interest in either expanding in town or moving to town. So I want the citizens to know that while we're still moving through the COVID-19 pandemic, we are still working on economic development activity to grow the city. And we appreciate all the businesses interested in that, as well as all the staff working hard to make that come to a fruition. Now we will jump into the COVID-19 update. As we started the COVID-19 task force that I've mentioned before in Clay County, way back in March, seems like a long time ago, uh, we do continue to meet daily. Most of the meetings throughout the summer, uh, we've monitored the activity and every time that there's been a either a legal update from the governor or uh, just a local community update that we felt we needed to focus on, we've always done that for you. Our pledge uh, as community leaders when we started that task force was to monitor the situation, uh, bring in the best advice uh, and advisors that we can as it relates to different topics. And at this time, we feel that it is important for you to hear from the hospital, from the school, and from the county uh, where we're at. If you look at cases uh, that have occurred, uh, Eric Tigges, the emergency management director, Dan and I were just uh, sharing a couple days ago shared a stat with us that uh, in the total number of cases in the last eight months to get to where we're at to today in positives in Iowa, uh, based on the curve in the last couple weeks, it's going to take us only 37 days to have another 8,000 total cases. And so that's of concern. We're also starting to see some impact as it relates to workforce, uh, when, especially when you look at the city, so next week from city operations, the staff and the elected officials are going to have serious conversations about what we need to do to stay proactive and stay ahead of making sure that essential services are still able to be delivered. By that, we're talking police protection, fire protection. We're talking about public works as it relates to sanitation, uh, garbage removal. Uh, we're coming into snow season. So to give you a perspective, there are departments in the city that have been impacted by COVID at any one time, anywhere between 10% and 30% of different departments have either uh, been in quarantine because they have COVID or have been exposed to COVID. So what that means to you as the citizens, if you have a snow event, we have roughly 10 snowplow drivers. If three or four of those snowplow drivers are in quarantine because of COVID, that's 30 to 40% of the plowing capacity that's gone from our city. In a snow event, it takes roughly two days, one and a half days to completely remove all the snow. And so what we wanna do is be able to maintain that uh, timeline. But if half of our workforce in that department is unable to work, it's gonna impact you as a citizen. Uh, we're also seeing some good examples, uh, some I would say uh, positivity as it relates to numbers. On our call, uh, Superintendent Heeman shared that the school absent rate, which would be you know COVID positive plus general absences, is under 3%, while our community positively COVID only rate is about 18.5 to 18.7% average. And so I think we can learn from the school about what they're doing to help keep those rates low. They're masking, they have sanitation uh, protocols in place, uh, they take it very seriously. And so 
Uh, part of what we want to do is get out ahead of this as a community. We want to try to limit the number of infections and put uh, the proper protocols and encourage the proper protocols in place. And so with that, I will uh, turn the microphone over to Chairman Skelton of the Clay County Supervisors. Again, thank you for tuning in. And uh, with that, here's Dan. All right. Thank you, Kevin, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, tuning into this uh, uh, broadcast. Uh, and we are trying to uh, present what is being done. I'll, I'll talk about what's being done at the county level and echo some of what Kevin has talked about county providing uh, essential services and we want to maintain the ability to provide those services to the citizens of Clay County. Uh, we have been and we continue to review some of the uh, protocols that we have. Uh, I'll talk specifically about the administration building. You'll remember, remember back in the spring that we had limited access to the building and uh, uh, encouraged people to uh, do their business either by mail or email or by telephone or uh, uh, through computers electronically. Uh, the public, uh, I will say, responded very well to that and uh, those practices continue today. Uh, we see that uh, people who access the building maintain social distancing. Uh, their most are masked and that is uh, good. Uh, we have uh, plastic barriers up to separate the public from our staff and our staff when they are in public areas uh, are always masked and uh, i think those are good protocols as as i said we are reviewing those with this recent uh, sharp increase in cases the question is are we doing enough to protect our staff and to protect the public and so those are some of the things that we're looking at now in in the county um, we're especially concerned with this uptick in cases because of the upcoming Thanksgiving Day holiday, Black Friday, Christmas coming up, there are going to be lots of instances in the days and weeks ahead when, when uh, people will want to get together. And uh, are, are we keeping everybody as, as safe as we can in those situations? So uh, w once again, we're urging the public to do what, what you've been hearing for the last eight months and that's uh, wear a face covering when you're in public, practice physical distancing, wash your hands, and, and stay home if you're sick. So those basic uh, things that we have talked about. Uh, in addition, we are uh, consulting with Clay County Public Health. Uh, we want their perspective on where the disease is in Clay County, how it's impacting not only our citizens, but uh, our facilities. The, uh, uh, hospital, the ability of public health to do its job and uh, to treat the uh, patients that may have to be treated in our facilities. So we're reviewing that. Uh, in the next week, we'll be having some uh, extended discussions with public health uh, and the Spencer Hospital on that topic, and we'll, uh, we'll look at what our options are from that point forward. Thank you, Dan. Uh, hospital CEO Bill Bumgarner. Good afternoon. Uh, Mayor, thank you for the invitation today. I appreciate it. Uh, would first like to offer a little bit of a background in regards to uh, the environment we're, we're in currently. Um, uh, as of this morning, the 14-day positivity rate um, uh, is over 20% both locally and, and throughout the state of Iowa. And that's four times higher. Uh, than uh, the rate that public health experts say increase the risk of community, um, uh, community spread, four times higher. Hospitalizations are at their peak uh, throughout the state of Iowa and locally. They've never been higher. Uh, patients requiring uh, care and in intensive care units in Northwest Iowa have been increasing throughout the fall. Uh, deaths in Iowa uh, due to COVID-19 are also at their peak. Um, they're similar to rates experienced uh, during the first couple months of the pandemic. So uh, we are in a critical stage um, as it relates to COVID-19 um, in our community and in our state. To give you some perspective as far as hospital services are concerned, uh, during the, the first five months of the pandemic, we had very infrequent inpatient hospitalizations for COVID-19. 
Uh, most days were probably zero. Um, um, and that has changed, though, over, over the last couple of months. Um, uh, over the past month, we've averaged five inpatients a day. Uh, over the past week, we have averaged seven inpatients receiving care. We've had as many as 11 uh, patients in the hospital uh, at one time uh, uh, receiving care due to COVID, and um, currently we have seven patients that we're, we're caring for. Um, similar to most other hospitals, and I, I uh, connect with colleagues uh, throughout, uh, primarily throughout the region, um, we're, all, we're all dealing and managing through uh, um, similar circumstances. Um, we're really stressed uh, as it relates to staffing to provide care that's needed um, to serve our communities. And a lot of that is due to we have increased COVID activity. Uh, this also tends to be a busier time uh, of year in healthcare, so our overall service volumes are higher. Um, and then also, we're losing staff members uh, related to COVID, either due to personal uh, illness, family illness, or a need to quarantine uh, because of uh, close contact type exposures. I'm, I'm so proud of our healthcare team. They're, they're working very, very hard. Uh, many people are working extra shifts. Uh, they're working extra hours uh, to meet uh, the care needs of those who entrust their care to Spencer Hospital. They're exceptionally dedicated, but the point I want to make, they're not made of iron. Uh, there's a human limit to how much you can work and, and how, how many times you can um, uh, respond to that call to work extra shifts and extra hours again and again. Uh, we try to access temporary staffing from agencies um, throughout the region uh, in order to help support that. Uh, but that's very inconsistent uh, because most every hospital is looking for similar type of um, assistance. The supply just does not meet the demand for that. Um, over the past several weeks, it's a day-to-day, -day, uh, sometimes several times a day process for us to uh, assess how many beds we're able to staff in the hospital. Uh, and are we able to perform elective inpatient surgeries? And we've had at least three occasions uh, in the last several weeks where we've actually had to cancel surgeries because we just did not have the ability to uh, staff um, for that. The thing that's so critical about this is that if the COVID uh, positivity rate remains high, uh, as it has been, it's been sustained there for uh, an extended period, hospitalizations will increase. Uh, and if that trend is sustained over a period of time, we reach our limits. Um, we may be forced, may be forced, uh, to limit or suspend elective outpatient surgeries or other non-urgent type services. And that would interrupt care, um, the care needs uh, to the community for the second time this year. Uh, in the spring, um, our hospital, Spencer Hospital, and other hospitals throughout the region and the country suspended some services uh, at the outset of the pandemic in order to prepare um, for um, the service volumes that we were anticipating. That also poses financial challenges uh, for the hospital for physician practices and those sort of things uh, if we are not uh, operating at normal capacity. And this is a real deal. The North Dakota governor just uh, recently announced that their hospitals in the state of North Dakota are at capacity. North Dakota is somewhat similar to Iowa. We're rural communities. Um, and the, the thing about that is their spike occurred before ours. Um, I hope, I hope that's not the glimpse of what our, our future is, is going to be. And I guess the point I would like to make more than anything today is uh, in Spencer and Clay County, we have a choice on, on how we approach this. And I want to make a, a strong case today that masking, social distancing, avoiding large gatherings will make a difference. It will make a significant difference. It's not going to eliminate the virus. Uh, but it will break, uh, bring down the rate of infection. It will provide time until we get 
uh, to a vaccination, um, which will begin uh, a, a process of which perhaps uh, we'll be able to get this behind us. Masks are our best resource right now. Um, and uh, in Spencer Hospital, uh, for many months now, we have been engaged in what we call universal masking. Uh, all of our employees, all of our visitors, uh, and our patients wear masks uh, based on particular criteria. Uh, we, when we have employees that um, uh, are, uh, um, uh, have the uh, coronavirus, we do contact tracing and virtually all of that contract tracing tells us that people acquired the virus outside of the hospital. Uh, we have had very, very limited exposures within the hospitals. Masks do, do work. And the CDC uh, just announced uh, recently, over the past week, that initially, uh, when we started masking, we thought we were doing that to protect the other person. Uh, now they believe, based on the studies they've reviewed, it also protects yourself. Um, and so I think we really need to um, all consider doing that. And on behalf of the entire Spencer medical community, I ask all of you to accept these basic precautions. Masking, social distancing, avoiding large gatherings. That is our best hope um, at uh, this point in time. It's gonna put fewer citizens uh, at, of our community at health risk, and it will support your healthcare workers, your teachers, and all our friends and neighbors uh, who are working in frontline occupations. We need to support one another. We need to care for uh, one another. And it may save the life of someone you know um, or someone um, that, that you love. And so I, I just ask the community, I implore the community, uh, these very basic precautions can make a significant difference. Thank you, Bill. Superintendent Heeman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to start off my time by taking a minute to thank the people who are making um, um, school possible for our students and families. Uh, everything about this school year is different and more difficult than anything our educators uh, have, have ever seen. Today marks the end of the first trimester of the school year. We are one third of the way through, through this challenging year. Uh, I could not be more proud of the staff of Spencer Schools and the efforts they are making to be there for our students and provide them with a quality educational experience. Kudos to our teachers, our teaching assistants, our bus drivers, food service staff, custodial and maintenance staff, district support staff, and administrators. This is a, a team of absolute rock stars who go above and beyond on a daily basis. I also want to thank our Spencer School Board members. You have provided leadership, support, and necessary resources for our students, staff, and our community. Without your leadership and support, we would not be in the position that we are in today. Uh, as a result, our schools are open. The teachers are teaching and students are learning. I'd like to give an update on, on a few numbers for you, a few, a few of our rates. Our illness rates for our students, um, which are, would, would be students that are ill with COVID or any other illness. Uh, these are not, not students that are out because of a quarantine situation. Uh, as of yesterday, our, yesterday uh, for a, a shot in time, yesterday, Thursday, November 12th, our illness rate was 2.46%. Um, we do have some students in quarantine. I'm not 100% sure of what that current number is right now, but we do have some students in quarantine. Uh, some related to quarantines that were produced from um, a few in school and a number of them from outside contact, outside of school. So our illness rate among our students in our schools is, is low, and it's been low. And, and I think that attributes to our wearing of masks. We, we have had staff that have had COVID or, or, or do have COVID. Um, throughout the school year, we have... Um, um, 34 staff members that have had COVID. That's about uh, a little under 9%. Um, the majority of those have happened, those exposures, those have happened outside of school. 
At Spencer Schools, we believe that it is best for our kids to be in school with their peers and their teachers, and we want to do all that we can to see that we're able to continue to do that. But COVID numbers in our community and our county are rising, and that is beginning to have an impact on our staffing capabilities. At Spencer Schools, our students and staff have been doing a good job with the mitigation strategies that we have in place. I am proud of the efforts of both our students and staff. Strategies such as mask wearing, social distancing, and additional cleaning and disinfecting are helping to limit our numbers and reduce the risk, but they do not eliminate them. Currently, we're seeing an uptick in cases of cases and exposures for our students and staff. Believes this coincides with what's happening out in our community and in our region. From our contact tracing and investigating, the majority of our cases and exposures are not happening within our school, within our schools. We believe that the increase is due to community spread. We believe that our schools are a safe place for both students and staff. The most important part of my message today is if we want our schools to stay open and continue to provide experiences for our kids this school year, then we must change the behavior in our community. Strategies such as wearing masks in public, social distancing, avoiding gatherings of people will help us keep our kids in school. And, and I'll finish by, by, with, by saying, let's keep our kids in school and our neighbors and loved ones out of our hospital. And, and I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you, Terry. Often I'm asked, uh, so what is different now? We went through this in the spring, we saw these lockdowns, and so why is it different now? It's different now because of the sheer raw numbers of positive cases and the trend line that we're on to continue the positive cases. So in the spring, you know, we were dealing with uh, single digits or, you know, hundreds of cases maybe positive in the state, and usually under 300. I think the highest in the spring was maybe 220, 230 in a given day. Now, if you follow the news, we're talking north of 4,000 cases a day in the state, and we're talking uh, sometimes in the uh, teens and the high single digits here uh, locally. That's what's different. We, we've never been in this type of situation before. We don't know how fast it will spread. Secondarily, we need to look at how we define community. We're not talking about just our zip code here. When we talk community in Spencer, we have a labor shed study that was recently completed. About 45% of the workers daily commute into Spencer. So you're looking at, uh, I think it's, it's in the thousands, one, like 1,800 to 2,500 people, somewhere like that, uh, commute in per day from about a 50 mile radius. And so when we're talking about community, we really want people to think about the influence that you have personally with your coworkers, the influence that you have with your family, the influence that you have with your friends and neighbors uh, to truly slow the spread of this disease. And as Bill has mentioned, possibly uh, save some lives here. We really need to think regionally and think bigger than just the uh, place where your house is. The other thing that I would like to touch on, and if we have time, Karen, maybe there's some questions that have come in. Um, we're all imploring you the hospital, the school, the city government, the county government, to uh, do what Bill said, put in all the controllable things that you can to display the best behaviors possible to limit the spread of the disease. Uh, we can only control our own behavior. There's things that are out of our control. We're not asking you to control that but practice good protocols, um, don't gather in large groups. The governor, just to touch on that really quick, so the governor had two press conferences this week. Uh, the first press conference, she uh, issued some new updates as far as restrictions, <clears throat> uh, gatherings of 25 uh, indoors, 100 outdoors, uh, some other things as well, and she was asked three times by the media what's next. She did not give any specifics, but she did state consistently with each question, this is a start. So I will take her at her word, this is a start. If the trend lines continue, I believe we'll see more to come like we did in the spring. And so uh, I have two kids in school, one's a fifth grader, one's a senior. 
Uh, I, like you, if you have kids, I'm sure school age, we don't want to see them at home learning, right? We want to keep them in school as Superintendent Heeman talked about. Uh, we don't want to see retail and commercial lockdowns like we saw this spring. Nobody, nobody wants that. And so what we're asking people to do is do what you can to try to help prevent those from occurring again, as well as freeing up uh, healthcare capacity. And so with that, Karen, are there any questions that came in? Biggest, the biggest one is why not mandate mask wearing if the pros outweigh the cons? Sure, I can answer that. Uh, probably the number one question I get outside of nuisance properties in town. <laughs> uh, so there's a couple uh, things. So when we talk about mandates, we're talking about civil law, okay? Uh, no different than it's an ordinance, whether it's a city ordinance, county ordinance, state ordinance. So when you deal with the law, you deal with enforcement of the law. And right now, um, in Iowa and other states, there's varying differences of who has the legal authority to issue these, and once they are issued, are they going to be enforced? So, for example, a handful of counties, a handful of cities have issued these. Some have punitive damages, you know, uh, civil penalties. Uh, some don't. And so, what I would like to say is, you can't. You can't legit in my this is my personal opinion. You can't forcibly legislate human behavior and that's the most effective way to do it. It is a way, it is a tool, it is a method. But at the end of the day, it's not the speed limit sign that keeps you from speeding. It's your foot on the accelerator. It it's not the the seatbelt law that keeps your seatbelt on in the car. It's you. You have to get in and you have to buckle it. And so it's the behaviors of that. What we want to do today at this point is to strongly encourage, let you know, share the scientific data. The one thing, the one thing, well, there's two, three, four things, right? Don't gather in large groups, sanitize frequently, use good hygiene, but also masking. Masking uh, does matter, and it has shown to be uh, a tool that can work. Is, is it Loctite 100%? Nobody knows that for sure, but we sure uh, want to try. And so. There is, uh, and Dan had mentioned this, uh, in the state of Iowa, by code, um, public health, each county has a public health uh, board. And the role of that board is to oversee um, pu the public health of that county. And so there, normally, you know, it's uh, business as usual with that board. You know, now we're in a pandemic, and you're starting to see in Iowa there have been a handful of counties through the County Board of Health that have uh, issued some mask mandates. Uh, Dan alluded to the fact um, in his presentation, and I don't want to speak for Dan, but that uh, they will be having those discussions at the county level. You know, in, in my opinion, uh, I think we need to follow Iowa code. If there is to be something like that, that's the path it needs to take. Um, I don't believe that mayors in the state of Iowa uh, really have the authority to number one issue proclamations like that. The Iowa Attorney General has ruled on that, and so I'm encouraging everyone to follow, follow the path that's already laid out in the law, and we can have those discussions uh, that way. Kevin, do I have just a second? Yeah, you bet. Uh, masks are not popular, they're not convenient, heaven knows, none of us like them, uh, but they are effective. I, I know that there are some stories out there that they're not, but as Bill alluded to, uh, the CDC has come with new guidance that they're not only effective in preventing the spread, but uh, protecting the wearer as well. And I'd just like to point out that Bill in his presentation and Terry in his pointed out that, that their emphasis on mask wearing among their staff and their students and the patients has proven has proven to be effective in keeping the rates of infection low in their facilities. What Kevin and I want to do is translate that effectiveness to the entire community. Mm -hmm. and, and so we are, again, encouraging uh, mass wear. Uh, we would encourage the governor, I think, uh, universally to, to uh, take that next step and mandate it for the state of Iowa. I think that would be helpful not just for Clay County and, and the Spencer community, but for the entire state. I would agree uh, with Dan uh, that uh, we should continue to send the message to Governor Reynolds uh, that uh, a, a mask regulation for the state would, would help us. And now uh, I concur with the mayor as far as um, kind of the realities of human behavior. Um, but 
we, we have to find a way to get ahead of this. Time is not our friend uh, at, this, at this point in time. And, and instituting any type of a, a mask mandate, we want to do that in a careful way. I agree with the mayor. We should do it in accordance to uh, the laws of our, of, of our state and our counties and our regions. Um, but doing nothing here is not an, an option right now. And we want to do those sort of things also in the way to protect everyone's interests as best we can. We want our re retailers to continue to operate. Um, we want to avoid the type of shutdowns that have happened in other parts of, of the state. And uh, uh, one of the items that came up in a recent task force meeting was just uh, the concern uh, by retailers that uh, if they try to enforce mask mandate, um, in their particular uh, places of business, uh, people might say, I'm going to go to the next town over then, um, if you're going to do that. A statewide uh, uh, mask mandate would help prevent those type of issues from occurring. We need the governor's help. And so I encourage everyone to contact your, uh, your, your state officials, uh, your state representatives, let them know how the pandemic is impacting you personally, how it's impacting your business, how it's impacting this community. Um, it can be very powerful uh, when we join together to send a strong message uh, that we have to do better. I have a couple other messages or questions here. It says, uh, how far away from max capacity is our hospital and what is the recovery rate been? How far away from what capacity? I'm sorry. Max capacity. Max capacity. Yeah. Uh, you know, basically, uh, at this point in time, um, we, we have typically been in the range of having two to five beds available for services. And a lot of thought goes into that as far as uh, keeping beds available for emergencies that come in and, and that sort of thing. So. I don't want to give the impression uh, to the community that we are being overrun, uh, like they're seeing in the state of North Dakota. But I want to be very clear, we're at the knife's edge here. Um, and our ability to continue this going forward every day gets increasingly more difficult. It's the goodwill um, of our uh, employees and our medical staff um, that are keeping us at the point we're at. If we see a significant surge beyond where we are right now, it's going to get much more difficult. And there aren't a lot of opportunities right now to refer patients out to other hospitals. Uh, a Vera McKinnon Hospital in Sioux Falls is where typically a lot of our transfers go. Um, and they are near max capacity on, on most days. Uh, even other area hospitals, as I talk to my colleagues in the region, are in very similar circumstances uh, to uh, Spencer Hospital. Uh, this is serious. And the other part of that is, what has recovery rate been? You know, most of the patients, uh, the COVID-19 patients that we have cared for have not had um, a real uh, serious um, um, uh, episodes of COVID. There have been four deaths in Clay County uh, that, that have occurred. Um, people are in the hospital uh, anywhere, on, on average, five to eight days uh, at, at the present time. It can go a little bit longer in, in uh, some isolated cir circumstances with that. Um, so uh, we've had a pretty good record of recovery uh, at Spencer Hospital. But I, I do, you know, want to share in looking at uh, the, the numbers from the state uh, coronavirus website this morning, we have had 47 of our citizens uh, die from COVID-19 in the Iowa Lake, Great Lakes corridor. Um, and so that is not an insignificant number. And I, I know there are folks that try to equate COVID-19 to the flu. Um, and um, it is accurate that uh, many cases of COVID-19 are, uh, are, are not highly serious. Um, it, 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 um, the episodes of death are not high, but there are also after effects, um, ongoing health issues, things like lung scarring and that sort of thing. 
COVID-19 is not like the flu. Um, we're dealing with a much more um, um, uh, challenging uh, type of uh, uh, illness w in this particular circumstance. And so I can't say enough that um, we have to take this very, very seriously. This one's for the uh, school. What will be the positive, what is it, so you might find it, I gotta find it. At what level of county positivity would the school seek a waiver? Um, well, I can tell you that there are some districts in the state that have, are seeking waivers right now or have been approved. Um, there are others that, are, that have not. Um, I, I think the bigger number for us is our illness rate, um, which according to the state recommendations would have to be 10%. Um, we're quite a ways from that. Um, and um, so to, in, in our mind it's, at the school, the illness rate is a much bigger number to, for us to be watching than the positivity rate in the county. So I, I don't know what that number would have to be, um, but I can tell you as long as our illness rate in our schools are low, we feel that schools are a safe are a good place for people to be, students and staff, at this time. All right, is that good, Karen? <clears throat> All right, does anybody have any final comments before we wrap up? Bill's good, Dan's good? Just thank you for hosting. Anytime. I'm good. I'm good. All right, thank you, Terry. I would just conclude with uh, the pledge that the uh, task force and that myself as your mayor uh, has made to you the public uh, during this pandemic is number one we would always be open and uh, upfront with you about what's happening in our community number two we would always be transparent uh, we want to make sure that you have access to the information and the trend lines that we see uh, number three uh, that we would continue to uh, keep you uh, apprised of the information in an informative and uh, deliberate manner and I also wanted to let you know that when we do make decisions that impact the community, we do not take them lightly. Uh, we don't make them in a rash manner. Uh, we try to get the best advice uh, that we can from industry experts, and that's why we have a task force. Uh, we are the only place in the state of Iowa that has a daily meeting, and that includes the amount of widespread, uh, impactful community organizations that we have. We have everything from governmental entities to the school to healthcare, uh, Elderbridge, Shelley is on there. Uh, we have the emergency management, the police, the fire, the sheriff, and so on and so forth. And other people come in and out uh, as needed. And so I want you to know we continue to take it very seriously and we will continue to manage this the best that we can from a uh, municipal leadership perspective. And with that, I would say have a great afternoon, get out, enjoy the sunshine, stay well, stay healthy, and God bless.